lot uh, for non winners, uh, but it's a wonderful competition. And the progress that's been made over the time that Rover Cup's been, been alive is absolutely astounding. I was very impressed with what Manuela uh, told us about this morning. So, what I want to do in this talk is to wave the flag for vision. Uh, vision is a wonderful thing, it's wonderful for people, and it's wonderful for robots. So, I want to talk a little bit about vision. And then I'm just going to give you a few examples of some robotic vision systems from my lab and finish up with some concluding remarks. So, you're probably not surprised at this. There are computers are much, much better at human beings at certain things, uh, emphasize certain. So, better than humans at chess for more than 20 years, better than humans at the game of Go for less years. There are actually much worse computers and robots at other things. And so, this problem of a child trying to pick up a, a specified chess piece is still something that's kind of borderline capability for robotics today. And that, general, that surprises the general public when I tell them this. So for you in the audience probably know that this is a wickedly hard problem, right? To recognize the piece, the plan at last, and go down, dexterously grab a, a chess piece without knocking other chess pieces up. <coughs> and even if we were to devote lots of PhD students and undergraduates to hack this problem to death, right? Then I can give you different chess boards uh, and you'd be back at the beginning. What we don't have is a sense of robotics and vision and manipulation that generalizes very well. Yet, robots are uh, in the sort of environments uh, like manufacturing and logistics. Robots thrive in these sorts of environments and have done in manufacturing for over 60 years now. Right? So, uh, for these sorts of tasks, which are well specified in environments that we refer to as constrained environments or structured environments, robots do really, really well. They make, they make money for their owners, right? They create wealth, which is a really important thing for robots to do if they're going to catch on. But if you look at other sectors of the economy, and you know, some of these are very important sectors in Australia, construction, mining, agriculture, we see very little penetration of robotics. And I think there's a good question now, why is this? Uh, it's a hard problem in many dimensions. Uh, and I'll, I'll, talk, I'll come back to this theme uh, in a bit. There's some of us dream about robots that are a bit less prosaic than a, than a construction robot or a mining robot. We want a robot that helps us in the house. Uh, We've been talking about things like this for, for decades. Science fiction writers have been talking about it for much longer than that. They still don't exist. So what's going on? Robots as we think about them today are heavily reliant on geometry. Right? Most of the problems, the important problems, sub-problems in robotics, we specify them, think about them geometrically. Navigation is a geometric problem. Manipulation is a geometric problem. And so we spend a lot of time trying to get geometric information, hard me metric information about the environment. We can do that with laser scanners, with uh, range finders like the Intel RealSense there. Uh, we get three-dimensional information and we use it to solve the problems geometrically. There are problems with purely geometric sensors. Uh, the geometry of a traffic light doesn't tell you anything about its state. Right? It doesn't tell you what color light is on, it just tells you the shape. The geometry of a person's face is probably too low resolution, certainly from a distance, to be able to recognize who that person is or their emotional state. So the yeah, iPhone X gets pretty good at doing that. It's using pure geometry from our structured light sensor to figure out whether you're the phone's owner or not. But certainly from a distance, from a Validine point cloud on a self-driving car, not enough information at all to be able to tell what, who that person is. Struggling actually to work out if it is a pedestrian, let alone who it is. Yet, we use vision, uh, our perception of the world from two eyes, two camera-like sensors, and we use it for almost everything in our daily life. We certainly use it for manipulation and for navigation. Uh, and there are some examples there. Uh, the young girl is using her sense of vision to understand the state of a Rubik's Cube. She's going to reason about it uh, and then plan a solution to the cube and do the manipulation with her fingers. Driving is basically a mapping from uh, visual perception through your brain to your actuators, which are your hands and your feet, right? So it's closed loop, uh, vision-based control system uh, with a human in that, in that loop. And juggling also is a very, is a visual task, but a very dynamic visual task. And actually says something about our ability to use our eyes, not just to say how the world is, but to predict how 
the world will be in the near future. And that's the, that's the amazing power of vision. It gives us a huge survival advantage if you can figure out what's going to happen over the next few seconds. It's really good for survival of the organism. So, the vision is a key sensing modality for most all organisms, whether they're simple or whether they're complex. So, a bee, right, has got a brain that weighs a gram, it's got a million neurons, which is a pretty simple structure actually in the, in the scheme of things. Yet, a bee is able to learn from other bees in a dance the direction, the range and bearing to a flower. So, it learns from another bee, a range and bearing, it goes out and it flies in that bearing angle with respect to the sun, and it flies a distance by integrating optical flow, it lands on the flower by controlling optical flow with respect to the flower until it is zero, and then it fills up with nectar and pollen. So, one gram brain right, is this exquisite, visually controlled machine. Uh, it's very deeply impressive. Human brain, uh, much more complicated. We've got around 1.5 kilos of brain matter, each of us. Uh, a third of that's devoted to vision. We've got about 10 to the 11 neurons and uh, many, many orders of magnitude more than that of synapses or connections or weights, right? So simple organism, complex organism, we're all vision-based machines. So where did this vision thing come from? How did the sense of vision even get to planet Earth? So, so right back to the beginning, we think our universe is nearly 14 billion years old. Uh, and back then it was all physics and particles and so on. Uh, around 4 billion years ago, our Earth crystallized out of all of that stuff. And we had an environment that was very rich for chemistry, right? Hot, lots of, lots of compounds there, uh, a lot of energy in the environment. 4 billion years ago, the Earth formed. 3 billion years ago, just 1 billion years after the Earth formed, life appeared on planet Earth. And it was very, very simple life. And it was very simple life for a very long time. So we got single cell organism uh, floating around in ancient oceans. Uh, and they absorbed molecules and nutrients. Uh, but they really didn't have a purpose. They just randomly floated around and absorbed molecules. Uh, they were in no way purposeful. <coughs> and then an amazing thing happened uh, only 540 million years ago, actually. All these uh, single cell organisms develop chemical receptors, seven helices that uh, go from inside the cell to outside the cell. So the bit that sticks out can detect a chemical, uh, and the uh, cell uses that. And so there was a mutation uh, in one of these uh, chemical receptors, uh, these seven helices. And what happened is this molecule got wedged in it, uh, retinol, and it's actually related to vitamin A which is why we do need to eat carrots in order to see well. We need vitamin A, it's a really critical part of the sensing system. Anyway, this, this retinol molecule got wedged in there, and the cool thing about retinol is that when you hit it with a photon, the end of it twists, right? So it hits a photon, the, the molecule, the red one there, twists, it distorts the helices, it thinks it's the same as having found an interesting molecule, and it sends a response into the cell. So we've turned a chemical receptor into a light receptor lovely accidental thing 540 million years ago. And so quite quickly that uh, got incorporated into, into simple organisms, I mean, the simple cells. Uh, you see this thing called an eye spot. Uh, it's some of, that, uh, some of those receptors connected to a little chemical motor that rotates the flagellum on a, on, a, on a cell. So this is a cell now that can move in response to light. And that gave an evolutionary advantage to cells that had that ability. Uh, they could move up and down in the water column according to, according to the light. In fact, it was such a brilliant idea that very, very quickly organisms got onto this bandwagon and started having multiple eye spots and they put them in a little shallow dish. And that meant that they could determine not just the amount of light, but where the light came from. We're starting to talk about organisms that can form a very crude image. Trilobite, one of my favourite creatures, sadly no longer existing, uh, kind of aced this. Uh, so they developed a crystalline compound eye, the stalk that you can see there on the right hand side. Uh, and these creatures were enormously successful. They roamed the oceans for 270 million years. Uh, probably one of the most successful organisms ever. Uh, and they were predators uh, and they were very definitely enabled by vision. And so if we look at the history of life on Earth, there was a big explosion in the number of life forms on Earth. We call it the, the 
can be an explosion. A great richness and diversity of life sprung up on earth. And it's around the same time that vision appeared on the scene. And there's a lot of debate about was it vision that enabled the Cambrian explosion? Uh, we will never know, and there's people arguing either side of the coin, but I think it's an interesting, interesting possibility that the fact that organisms could see sparked an arms race in, across organisms that led to the diversity of life that we see today. So if we look at life today, uh, there is many, many different eye designs. So eyes have been invented uh, multiple times independently. So we see those little blue dots up there, the eyes of a scallop, uh, little reflect, almost like reflector telescopes. Uh, the Nautilus has got a pinhole camera lens. Octopus has got an eye that looks very much like ours from the outside. On the inside is completely flipped around. Uh, spiders have got multiple eyes. Uh, great richness of eyes on, on the planet Earth. So, what's in the human vision uh, data sheet? Uh, eyes, about 120 megapixel cameras, dynamic range of about 10 to the 6, uh, 20 bits, which is pretty extraordinary. We can build cameras like that, they're still expensive, uh, but you know, that's, that's what we've got. Uh, we've also got a bunch of gyroscopes and accelerometers in our, in, our, in our inner ears, and they're actually a critical part of helping us to understand the world. They help disambiguate uh, the, the motion of the world versus the motion of my body. If I'm moving, the world appears to move according to my eyes. The gyroscopes and the accelerometers can tell me whether it's me or the world that's moving. And here's the other part of the, the human visual uh, system data sheet. It's the vision engine. Uh, as I mentioned before, 10 to the 11 neurons almost. And my vision engine weighs 500 grams and it consumes 6 watts. And that's the kicker for all of us people who are using GPUs to solve hard vision problems. Right? We do it in six watts. Uh, and that's, that's, that's got to be the goal. It's got to be what we shoot for. Interestingly, if you look at the way the visual system works, and this is a very simple, this is an engineer's view, uh, view of the, the visual system. We've got the eye, 120 megapixels. It gets reduced to uh, about one megapixel in the back of the eye. In the retinal ganglion layer, those pixels all get merged. It's like feature extraction. A million features then go, go forward to a part of your brain called the LGN, which is right in the middle of the bottom of your brain. And then some of those neurons go into your visual cortex. Interestingly, a ton more data comes forward from the visual cortex to the LGN. So I'm not sure we have a full understanding yet of what's going on, but it's very <coughs> likely that the visual cortex is making hypotheses about what's in the world. The LGN is doing matching. So your brain is making lots of hypotheses. And it's like those optical illusions. Sometimes you can see this, sometimes you can see that. These are hypotheses coming, coming uh, I'll say backwards, from the, from the B1 into, into the LGN. So that's pretty interesting. The other thing that I want to, want to point out, and I think is really important, is that seeing is an active process, right? We do not take pictures of the world and process those images one by one in our brains. We absolutely do not do that. And this is a big trick that I think we, we're, we're missing as artificial vision people, right? The eye contains the fastest moving muscles in your body. Uh, it's able to, to, to slew and stop incredibly quickly. And some examples of, of, of how that works in action, this is a very, very old study, but basically subjects were wearing eye tracking glasses. They're looking at a picture and they'll ask questions. And so the lines that are superimposed on those, on those paintings indicate where the human's gaze went and as a function of the questions they were asked. And you can see that the path that the eye took varies a lot depending on the question. So if the question is what are the ages of the figures in the painting, eyes kind of scanning up and down to check out the height, and then it's looking at their face to see how wrinkly they are. Right? You're not thinking about doing this, your brain is commanding your eye to make these kind of motions quite unconsciously. The other one is what's the material circumstances of the family, and what the subject's eye here is doing, it's checking out the jewellery, it's checking out the paintings on the wall, it's checking out the quality of the clothes and the furniture. Right? all unconsciously. So your eye, your brain is not taking a picture and parsing it, extracting all the pictures, 
right? What you're doing is pointing the eye at the part of the image that's going to help you learn what it is you learn, need to learn at this particular moment in time. So uh, the kind of last thing I really want to say about, about seeing is that it's really a very complex coupled set of behaviours and thought processes. You know, we, uh, we create memories, uh, visual memories, uh, and the memory the memory helps us when we're seeing a new scene, but we use our vision to lay down visual memories. We have a notion of context. Here in the context of a lecture theatre, there are some things that I would expect to see, and a whole bunch of things I would not expect to see. It helps me pass the scene, because all sorts of things like trees and elephants and motor cars are just not going to be part of the picture. It's a much simpler problem to understand this scene. So the, knowing the context helps me understand the scene, but I need to understand something about the scene in order to determine which context I'm in. So it's kind of a circular problem. There are all these really interesting circular problems uh, associated with our visual process. So, given the amazing, how amazing our visual system is, it's not surprising engineers, computer scientists, and others have spent a lot of time trying to emulate this using computers. And there are really two, two areas here. One's image processing, an image goes in and an image comes out, enhanced in some particular way, and computer vision, which is much closer to what we're interested in as roboticists, where an image goes in and data comes out. Uh, and I'll introduce in a moment a distinction between computer vision and robotic vision. But I was intrigued by a, a slide that Manuela put up this morning, so I'm going to offer this one. Uh, this was the Summer Vision Project from 1966, uh, calling for a few vac a vacation students to solve the vision problem one summer. Uh, <laughs> we're still nowhere near solving the vision problem. But people were ambitious back then, and that's a good thing. So I, I talk a lot about robotic vision, and to me, robotic vision is computer vision with a bunch of added constraints. One is, it's a computer vision system connected to a machine, and the machine does physical work in the physical world. The images are temporarily correlated. So that means from frame to frame, the image is somewhat similar to what it to what the last image was. And that's different to the kind of problems that computer vision people look at when they're classifying images from the image in a data set. There is no temporal correlation in those image sequences, those database images that they use. But for a robot, the images are correlated, and that's very important. The vision system has to provide actionable information. The robot's moving in the physical world, it's a physical thing. It needs to get information that it can act on from the vision system. It's got to be fast, low latency, high rate. Getting geometry would be pretty handy. It needs to be robust to variation uh, in the appearance of the world. And it needs to be either accurate or it needs to report what the uncertainty is. Because as roboticists, we're pretty good now at reasoning about uncertain information. So if the sensor can tell us how uncertain it is, then we can reason about that and put some probabilistic bounds on where we are and where the other things in the world are and plan accordingly. So this to me is robotic vision. Now in the early days, it might be something like this. It might be a, a, a robot picking things off a conveyor belt, which is a pretty simple problem, high contrast, planar environment. It might be like the early days of RoboCup soccer, right? Simple environment, everything was color coded, lighting was mostly controlled, and you could understand what's going on. The real world, where we want robots to work, is not nearly so accommodating. Uh, so working in the real world has got a number of challenges. So I want to start and talk now about what are some of the challenges about using vision for robots. Let's start with this picture of mountains. There are two points here, A and B. Everyone tell me which point is closer, A or B? A. Yeah, everyone says that, and that's good. Uh, but actually, that's flat, right? That's a picture of mountains, right? <laughs> Yet, everyone says that A is closer than B. They're actually both points on a plane. Yet everyone's pretty convinced that A is closer than B. So all of you know something about mountains, right? There's something in your brain that lets you interpret that scene and just say instantly, A is closer than B. And that's interesting, because if we take a three-dimensional scene and we uh, look at it with a camera, we're doing a projection from 3D into 2D. We're projecting that image onto the image plane. So there's only two dimensions left. And that causes all sorts of interesting distortions, right? Parallel lines appear to converge. And if you look at those converging railway tracks, you look at them and you think they're parallel. So in your head, you've unpacked that. You've unpacked this uh, projective, projective uh, mapping 
from 3D to 2D, you've kind of inverted it, and you look at that and say, yeah, they're parallel lines. Everyone knows that. The Ferris wheel, right? It looks like an ellipse, but everyone knows that Ferris wheels are circular. So you're able to get around the limitation of this perspective projection using a lot of knowledge assumptions uh, that you've learned through your lives. Maybe some of it's part of the way our brains are wired, uh, but we certainly have the ability to do that. And most people say, okay, it's because we've got two eyes, right? We use binocular stereo and we figure out how far away things are. Interestingly, actually, we've got about eight different <laughs> tricks that we use to invert uh, this perspective projection and figure out how far away things are. So uh, binocular stereo is absolutely one of them. Uh, it is an important way for us to get three-dimensional structure of the world. We also use what's called accommodation, and that is if I'm looking at something close, once upon a time, the muscles in my eyes used to squeeze the lens so that it would focus. It doesn't happen anymore, I wear, I wear glasses. But we get a signal back to our brain from the muscle that's squeezing the lens to keep stuff in focus, and that's a cue about how far away things are. And then we have vergence, so our eyes uh, have got a low-level reflex to uh, focus our uh, the point at an object that's close to us. So we get feedback from those muscles into our brain to tell us something about how far away things are. And those two middle mechanisms there work well for things that are close. We also use what we call motion perspective, where we know that if I'm moving, things that are near me move fast and things that are further away move more slowly. So we do this effortlessly as well. We use simple things like occlusion. The cat's behind the bush because the bush hides part of the cat, right? It doesn't really give us a ranking of distance. But that's handy. We know something about trees, and so we could know something about how high the tree is, and if it looks small in that field of view, we say it must be far away. Uh, texture density. The spatial frequency of the texture gets higher as the, as the ground moves further away from us. So up close, the spatial frequency is low, further away, spatial frequency is higher. And then there's stuff that mountains that are far away are blue and fuzzy, and we know that as well. So all of these mechanisms are baked into our brain. Uh, yet they can be tricked. Uh, so here are some examples of uh, some wonderful uh, chalk art and building art that uh, tricks us into thinking the scene is uh, three-dimensional when, when in fact it's not. Uh, well, not that it's three-dimensional in a different way to how it appears. Now, computer graphics people have been working on uh, solving figuring out how to create images of the world based on a complete model. And so I just, just uh, unpack this equation. So I'm saying an image is some function of the geometry of the scene, the materials it's made on, V, which is where I'm standing, the lighting, uh, atmospheric conditions, and random noise, right? But we can model all of that. We can write all the projection equations. And given a complete model of the environment, I can synthesize, ray trace a beautiful image of it. Uh, and here it is again. What we're trying to do in computer vision is the opposite. Right? We're trying to invert that function and say, given an image, what's, the, what's its geometry, what's it, made of, what's it made of, and where am I standing? And this is a very ill-posed problem. Right? It doesn't actually have an inverse. And you can't solve it unless you bring constraints or additional knowledge to bear on the problem. And so I'm going to show you now some examples of things that initially look weird. Uh, until your rational brain kicks in and says, no, there are no small people, uh, it must be uh, a person standing further away, it must be that the furniture is very, very big, uh, or in the example on the right-hand side, it must be that the people are in a room that's got very odd geometry, because people can't change their height like that. We know that, all right? So, uh, we can be we can be tricked initially, but then the rational brain kicks in and, and we solve it. So we've got a lot of knowledge that we bring to bear on this problem of figuring out the geometry of the world. Uh, we don't have metric sensors, we don't have lasers, but we get along very well without them. Now, there's been a lot of work in uh, the geometry of computer vision, and so we can do things like take uh, images from a camera from multiple viewpoints and we can stitch them together using feature extraction, data association, bundle adjustment, and figure out a decent three-dimensional model of the thing that we're looking at, as well as the path that the camera took through space. We know how to do that, but we do this in a very mathematical way, very different to what human beings do uh, in, their, uh, in their heads. So that's a bit of a, a bit of some 
comments about the problems we have trying to extract geometry from the world using these two sensors that we have in our heads. Another problem that robots face is that it's important for a robot to have a sense of location. The robot wants to know where it is. And sometimes the appearance and the location don't match very well. So here we've got each column represents the same place under different conditions. So the first column is the same place, but with different atmospheric conditions. Right? It's now night time and it's now raining. It would be interesting to find a computer vision algorithm that could say those two images represent the same place. That's an important thing for a robot to know, and human beings can do it somewhat well. Uh, in this case, it's the same place, but the lighting conditions have changed. We've gone from uh, overcast illumination at the top to a uh, sunny day with, with quite distinct shadows. Now, an edge detector, uh, most corner detectors get very excited in the bottom image and focus on the edges of all the shadows. Shadows aren't real things, right? They're not part of the geometry of the scene, they're an artifact, uh, and that's, that's important. And this last, ex the third column is interesting to me because it's the same place, but now you could argue that it's the same place, but it's made of different stuff, right? It used to be made of dirt, and now it's made of snow, because that's what's on the top, right? Same place. <laughs> radically different appearance because it's now made of different stuff. Um, and that's a challenge for a robot. So here's a, some examples, a couple more different examples where we change the lighting conditions and the viewpoint. You can see that the, the patterns of pixels look very different, yet they're the same, we're in roughly the same place. Third one is that there's a lot of variation uh, but across viewpoint and across object objects within a class, right? At, uh, we seem to be able to deal with quite effortlessly, but until recently, computer vision algorithms really struggled. These are clearly all tea and coffee cups, right? We know that, a small child knows that, but to get an algorithm that could recognize that through that object recognition problem until recently was very hard. And I'm sure many of you uh, have probably started your, your career in robotics or computer vision recently, and so you've grown up knowing about deep learning, convolutional neural networks. It wasn't always that way, right? From really, from 2012 was the classic paper. That was the, the, the fork in the road. Uh, this paper at NIPS in 2012, it's often called AlexNet, right? And it was really the first convolutional neural network aimed at object classification. And this, the vertical axis in this graph is the classification error. And we can see that AlexNet was a significant step down, an improvement, uh, step down in error, and it just keeps improving year on year, right? So that's a technology most people in the room take for granted now. It was a revolution in our ability to perceive the world. The world's really complicated uh, for reasons that I've outlined. So you know about YOLO, and you probably know about image captioning, you probably know about networks that can hypothesize that the skeleton of, of human beings. Uh, we can create networks that take a single image and hypothesize the distance. So produce a range image from a monocular image, which is something that we can do reasonably well. We cover one eye, we can know what's close and what's far. Uh, we, can, we can put that skill into a network. Another example of uh, pixel-based segmentation, right? It's much more useful to know the class of a pixel than to know its color, right? To know a pixel's got this much red, this much green, that much blue, yeah, no use at all. But if I know it's a ground pixel, or it's a tree pixel, or a pedestrian pixel, that's actionable information that as, that I can, as a robot uh, I can use. And we train networks now to estimate the pose of objects, uh, which is really useful if we're trying to manipulate those objects. And I'm sure, as you all know, we've been driven by innovation in three areas. Uh, much, much better computers, uh, GPUs, CPUs, TPUs, much better algorithms. And you look on archive, the, the rate of innovation in algorithms mm -hmm. for uh, training networks based on lots of data is astounding. And then we have huge amounts of data to learn from. And what really fascinates me at the moment is how a lot of this technology that was not even known about to researchers 10 years ago is being commodified. So, you know, TensorFlow, open source software, uh, MATLAB's deep learning toolbox, reinforcement learning toolbox, you know, puts these, these kind of really complicated, cutting edge uh, capabilities in the hands of almost anybody now. Uh, down the bottom, there's an edge AI device. It's a camera with a neural network processor built into it. 
cost less than 100 bucks. Uh, and the bottom line is some uh, neural network training app for an iPhone. Uh, so this technology, in the labs 10 years ago, dream 10 years ago, maybe in the labs eight years ago, now it's a product or it's free. It's extraordinary uh, situation to be in. A thing that uh, I find quite surprising is, I guess I grew up with sort of a classical engineering training. And so if I wanted to, uh, to control something, I'd make a model of it and then I'd design a controller and then I'd simulate it and then I'd put it on the machine and hopefully it would work. Uh, these days we don't necessarily do that anymore. We just train a reinforcement learning system in simulation uh, and then put it on the machine and mostly it works. Uh, so there's a big difference in the way we think about problems today versus what we thought about, how we thought about them 20, 30 years ago. I suspect we're still teaching our students the old way. So as soon as they graduate, they're going to be into the new way. So we've got to fix that. Another thing I want to talk about is oftentimes when we we solve, think about problems as roboticists, we sort of want to put coordinate frames on everything and solve it all with the problem in geometry. Uh, and geometry is very powerful. We can do great things with geometry. But if I'm threading a needle, I'm not using any geometry at all, right? I am trying to line up with my eyes the end of the cotton with a hole in the needle, right? I don't, I haven't estimated the pose of the needle. I have not estimated the pose of the end of the cotton, but I can solve the problem by lining them up in the image. So this is a technique that's referred to as vision-based control or visual surveying. And here's an example here of a camera that's moving so as to bring those four spots into the desired location within the image. And this control algorithm is running without any explicit pose estimation. It's a controller based on error in the image plane. And if you write the maths out correctly, you can build this controller without having to know the pose of anything. And I think this is an important that's bridge between the way humans think about problems and the way roboticists tend to think about problems, uh, which is very, very heavy on, on geometry. Uh, so I'm going to just skip those two. Uh, but here's an example of something I did a long, long time ago at CSIRO. And this is basically the uh, threading a needle problem. The, 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 the needle now is a hook on a great big forklift truck vehicle, and the eye of the needle is the uh, handle on this great big metal crucible. And so uh, just by using error in the image plane, we're able to uh, pick that crucible up very reliably, even though we don't know the pose of the vehicle or the pose of the crucible. And we did this long-term trial, put, putting a crucible uh, down, going away, picking it up, moving it to another place just to show how robust it was. So that's a bit of a rant about vision and why I think it's important. And we can have arguments later if you disagree. I'd like just to go quickly now through a few things that are happening in the lab. Uh, I'll go through these pretty quickly. Picking things up is an essential capability for robots. And so we entered a competition, a big fan of competitions. We entered the Amazon uh, Picking Challenge in 2016. Uh, with Baxter Robot, and we didn't do very well. And the next year, we built our own robot, robot Cartesian Robot, and here's an example of it of it working. Uh, so it's actually had two grippers. It had a two-finger pincer on one end. It could rotate it around to a vacuum gripper. An Amazon competition in 16 and 17, most people were using vacuum grippers. There are all sorts of really gnarly objects in that box, and, uh, bags of marbles, things made of, things made of mesh, things that are soft, things that are hard, things that are transparent. So it is actually quite challenging. And here we see the robot coming in and picking up uh, a, packet of, a packet of socks. So that's the robot in action. That's the mechanics of the robot. What was really critical to our success really was the vision system that we had. So we used RGBD images. We were able to segment on the boundaries of the different objects and to label them pretty reliably. Uh, which was important in this competition because you had to pick particular items out of the out of the tote. One thing that Amazon did in this competition was, in the previous years, you knew in advance all the objects you had to deal with. In the 2017 instance of the competition, you got given 40 objects half an hour before the competition that you'd never seen before, but your robot would be asked to pick up. And so we had to train very rapidly. So the students there. Uh, placing objects in different orientations in front of the cameras, grabbing some images, and we had a rack of GPUs next to us which was tweaking and retraining the network uh, so that it was able to do a good job of object recognition. Anyway, the combination of a good vision system and a good robot uh, meant that we won the competition, uh, which was uh, made us very happy. Uh, we didn't do 
so well in uh, Rabbit Cup this year. All right. So then we got me interested in this business of picking. Uh, you, could, you could argue that a robot that can't pick things up really isn't much use for anybody. Anyway. So we got interested in picking, and one of my students, Fanny Zhang, who finished uh, 18 months ago, built a network uh, that took an image and output robot joint velocities directly. Uh, so that's the network. Images in, velocities out. We trained in this simulation, uh, so it's a deep RL network that did that, and we trained it to pick up, to reach blue cubes. Uh, and we trained it to be immune to clutter. So here is the robot. Uh, you see Fanny, there's a blue cube there, and the robot is sort of relentlessly reaching for that blue cube. Um, irrespective, of, uh, irrespective of the clutter. The camera is actually in the back to right hand, which you can see in the background up high, uh, looking down at the scene. So trained in simulation, a little bit of tweaking to get it working in the real world. There's only uh, tens of labelled images were required to transfer the learning from simulation world into the real world. I uh, know my student Doug Morrison has been doing work on grasping and so in this one what he's doing is taking um, a depth image and outputting a grasp specification in terms of where should I grasp, how far apart should my fingers be and what should the orientation be. And so this network runs wickedly fast, right? 30 frames a second, uh, it takes a depth image uh, and synthesizes the appropriate grasp. So it's really useful if objects are moving quickly. Right? We can keep updating the grasp as we approach. We need to stop updating when the robot gripper gets close to the object because the real sense camera goes blind when things are less than 30 centimeters away. Right? But if the real sense didn't have that limitation, we could servo all the way up to the end. And here's another example of servoing in clutter. And there it's focused on the banana, it's the most graspable thing there, uh, and ignoring everything else. This is probably one of my favourite vision-based machines out of my lab. And this is a project uh, funded uh, in large part by Google. Uh, it's got two stereo cameras, two in the front and two on the bottom. Uh, there's a Jetson on board. It's using the bottom cameras to figure out its height above the seabed and its velocity with respect to the seabed. And the front cameras are used, to, are used for obstacle avoidance. Uh, so this robot can do things like, like follow reefs, uh, take do photo surveys, uh, monitor the state of the the state of the environment. More recently, what we've done with this robot is to cap is an experiment we did late last year is to capture a ton of the coral spawn. Once a year, coral reefs spawn. This whole ton of egg and sperm goes up into the ocean. We capture that, and what we're doing is raising them till they get to be slightly bigger baby corals, and then we're reseeding them on areas of coral uh, that are. Been, that have been badly knocked around right, by storms or by, by bleaching events. So the robot's going along, it's looking at the kind of coral that it's, that it's swimming over, and if it thinks that it's prospective place for the baby corals to be deployed, then it will squirt them out. So instead of leaving it to the randomness of the oceans to put all this stuff up there and see where it goes uh, with a robot, we can target uh, the, the receding of, of coral reefs. Okay, a couple more things. Agriculture, really big industry in this country. And agriculture has, over, over centuries, has, has allowed us to feed more and more people with less and less farmers using pretty much the same amount of land or even less land. <coughs> We've done that through genetic engineering, mechanization, and herbicides and pesticides. Uh, and agricultural equipment over time has got bigger and stronger. Uh, that's, that's a fact. Uh, here's another thing that a lot of people don't know about is by pouring herbicides on plants, on weeds for 50 years, they're fighting back. They become resistant to the herbicide. Uh, this is something that keeps farmers awake at night because they don't have anything else in their arsenal to attack weeds with. And uh, one of the reasons that the machines got bigger and bigger over time is because these machines were manned and they had a human driver. If you, and so because you're trying to maximize the productivity of that farmer, you want the machine to be as wide as possible, as fast as possible, it makes it as heavy as possible, which is not really a good place to be engineering-wise. So with a, a, a very innovative farmer, uh, we, we started a project quite a lot of years ago now to create small modular robots that could uh, operate 
uh, in parallel over large areas of land. So instead of having one big machine with a driver, lots of small autonomous machines, which had potentially many advantages. So one of the things we could do with this robot is we downward looking cameras. Uh, we can look at the individual plants and we can classify them. Is it a good plant or is it a bad plant? And then once we know what sort of plant it is, then we've got a number of different things, some remedies that we can apply to that plant. So we can locally apply herbicide. Instead of putting it everywhere, we just put it on the plant if we know that it's amenable to herbicide. Or we can actually mechanically dig it out of the ground. Uh, you can also use microwave, you can also use steam, you could use flamethrowers. There's all sorts of things you could use to kill weeds, right? It doesn't have to be herbicide. And in an environment now where we have an increasing number of herbicide resistant weeds, uh, that's probably pretty important. It's another robot, another vision-based robot, uh, which harvests what we Australians call capsicums, but some people call bell peppers, sweet peppers, red peppers. These things, right? Uh, the robot harvests these. Again, vision-based vision -based robot, real sense camera on the end of a UR5. There's the point cloud that the robot sees. And using color, texture, and shape, we can quite easily segment the fruit from everything else. Plant a grass, go in, and we do a one-handed pick. So we attach to it with a vacuum gripper, saw through the stalk, uh, and then we're left with uh, the fruit hanging uh, on, the, on, the, on the gripper. At the moment, this is about half the speed of a, of a human picker. But this work was motivated by very real labor shortages in agricultural areas. Thanks, Marianne. All right, I'm gonna skip that one. And just, we just finish up with a few observations. What's next in this whole robotic vision area? We're blessed with amazing technology, cloud computing, GPUs, all sorts of different cameras, uh, low, low light cameras, uh, wide field of view cameras, all of that. But I think there are some things, some tricks that we're missing, right? Uh, I think that we're not doing enough with active perception or tension. We still want to capture the whole frame, process the whole frame, and then figure out what to do with the information we pass from the whole frame. We don't do that. We apply attention to where it's important. If I'm navigating out of this room, I don't care at all about the ceiling. Nothing useful on the ceiling, right? If, I, if my task is navigating across the floor. Uh, probably the same for the walls. We don't use context, and I talked about context before, and I think visual memories are probably also something important. So there's some tricks from nature that I think we need to we need to learn and we need to apply to the next generation of systems. It's going to be critical if we want to get the power consumption of robotic vision down from thousands of watts to six watts, which is you know the current best on earth, right? That's what we're going to need to pinch tricks from nature. So in the last slide, uh, vision is a very old technology. Uh, most animals use it a lot. We've got existence proofs that robots just need one or two cameras. I can do tasks with one or two cameras. Why should a robot not be able to do that? So I think the challenge is algorithmic. It's not the sensors that are lacking. It's our understanding of good algorithms or computing architectures that allow us to process the rich visual data to, to provide that actionable information that a robot needs. Uh, deep learning, big leap forward, absolutely. But we're not there yet. Uh, on the left hand side, there are some books about biological vision that are wonderful to read. I find this area very fascinating. And down the bottom is a plug for my, one of my educational resources called the Robot Academy. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was totally awesome. Really, really, really great. So we hope to see you at RoboCup next year. What? Huh? It's in Bordeaux. Yeah, exactly. Well, at least go there to check it out. All right, question time. Who's got questions? Yeah, go ahead. In the, um, the image where you're tracking uh, the picture, trying to determine their ages or their inventory wealth and that kind of thing, uh, it's still true that, that they have to, the person has to first analyze the entire image to figure out where those point, or points are first. Though. Isn't that right? So you're talking about the eye tracking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the you don't know where the faces are before you understand the image in the whole. What you say makes sense, but that's the data. This is the data that's published as the eye tracking result. So quite how we work out where the faces are to start with, I don't know. That's where your that's where your fovea is pointing. So your fovea is where you've got this incredible richness of. of, of photoreceptors, right? The bulk of the photoreceptors in the fovea, a little tiny few degree cone of view, yeah? 
So you've still got your peripheral vision, which is picking up the, the bulk of the scene. So you've got generally maybe 50, 60 degree field of view. Don't, don't quote me on that. Right. So you've got a low res view of everything, but you're pointing your fovea, the high resolution, the high color acuity part of your eye at those particular parts of the scene. So I think, yeah, it's your peripheral vision is telling you the general picture and you're pointing your fovea. Thank you. Yeah, and then there's another one at the back as well. First, thanks for the presentation, it was really nice. And I want to know your opinion about event cameras. I know of any cameras. Look, they're, they're an interesting technology. Uh, they're hard work because the information is in such an unusual format to what way we normally think about images. There is an analogy that's made that it is somewhat more biological because it's a series of, of spikes and people have built spiking visual processing systems with event cameras at the front end. Uh, people are starting to get some results now with event cameras. They're start, starting to be able to mimic things that we can do with ordinary cameras. Uh, so the image reconstruction, depth estimation, slam can now be done with the bank camera. It's hard work. The big virtue you have is a dynamic range. Right? That's very, very powerful. And that's the thing that's most conventional cameras we have still struggle with dynamic range. I said that we've got a 20 bit dynamic range in our eyes. You know, most of the cameras we use are 8 or 10 bit. Uh, so those the dynamic range is important. The bank cameras are perhaps the best way we can get dynamic range at the moment. Either that or log response. So they're interesting. Uh, people are doing good work with them, but they still seem to be a little bit boutique. I hope I'm not offending anyone. Well, that's just an opportunity, right? Hmm. Okay, next question. Um, you mentioned that uh, the hardware should actually be uh, sufficient that we have today. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, you said that the reduction of eyes goes from 150 megapixel to 1.2 megapixel on the axon. To yep. me, that is an indication that a lot happens in the hardware. My question to you is, um, do we not miss something very substantial from the transition of the biological to the engineering type of? So what this reduction from 100 megapixels to around 1 megapixel happens in the, in the retinal, uh, behind your retina, a uh, whole bunch of uh, early visual processing happens there. They're essentially feature detectors, and people have, have commented quite a lot on the fact that the first layer of a convolutional neural network, the responses that these networks learn look spookily like the response functions that exist in the cells in the back of our retina. So there seems to be a, a, an alignment or a convergence uh, in what our trained networks have, have, have come up with versus what we've evolved. So there is definitely feature extraction happening there. Okay, great. Well, seems like you've got the president of the Robocop Federation excited. Uh, there's, a, there's a question there in the middle. Do you want okay. to raise it? Oh, you've got it, okay. okay. Uh, Hi, thanks Peter for the, the nice, uh, this nice talk. Uh, I would uh, like uh, to share with us your uh, insight of, uh, of, of, of the research in uh, robot vision in mid-term, let's say five to ten years and long-term. Prediction, predictions are, is, a, is a tough business. Uh, I would like to hope that in you know, 10, 10, 15 years time, the, the cameras would be a viable means of providing spatial awareness to robots, right? Uh, it isn't at the moment, it's still, we can build point solutions, right? We can, I gave you a few examples of robots that use vision for this or for that or for another thing, but each one was engineered by a team of smart people to solve a particular problem. So we still don't have a very good, uh, good idea of a, of a general visual solution. Uh, 
I hope it's not as elusive as general AI, uh, but I think there needs to be general vision. Uh, but I, I don't know when it will, I don't know when it will come. I suspect there's gonna have to be some breakthrough actually in computing architecture because our brains are very three-dimensional. At the moment we're doing processing, our processes are essentially planar. I guess with networks of them, GPUs, it's kind of a multi, it's maybe it's a stack of planes, but it's not as deeply three-dimensional as our computing architecture is. Uh, and I suspect we probably need to somehow create that to get the, the computational richness that we're going to need to solve this problem. I haven't answered your question, I'm sorry. Just say quantum vision. That's uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, uh, all right, last question. Peter, you're going to be around a little bit, are you? Oh, well, okay. Yep. Hello. Yes, okay. Um, so my question is uh, for machine vision. So we have different types of sensors, right? There's thermal imaging, there's uh, hyperspectral imaging, and there are a lot of other technologies as well. Mm -hmm. So my question is, does machine vision have the potential to actually perform, do better than human vision? Sure, you could imagine uh, a, a superhuman vision where we could see over a uh, much broader range of the spectrum uh, than, than we can. I mean, we've got a relatively limited window into the spectrum. It's clearly sufficient for human survival, existence proof for that. Uh, but I think we could do many more interesting things if we had hyperspectral vision uh, and you know, more than, had more than three channels. So we'd be able to recognize materials uh, much more exquisitely even if within the, the visible band that we had, instead of having just three channels, we had a hundred band channels across the red, green, blue spectrum, uh, that would be very powerful as well. So absolutely, we could imagine superhuman vision. Thank you. I, I have the prerogative of asking a question because I'm really interested in, if, if you look at integrating our vision with other senses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we do, I, I break the flag for vision, and that's my job. But I, I'll, be, I'll be honest and say that for things like picking something up, vision's a lot of the game, but it's not the whole game. And part of that is that as my hand gets closer to the object, uh, my hand obscures the object. Uh, and I can still pick things up very reliably. So I'm using vision to plan the motion. At some point that motion becomes completely open loop because I can't close the loop visually anymore, it's obscured. And then I'm relying on tactile perception to tell me when I've made contact. And then I'm relying on feedback then from muscles of my fingers, uh, the force information to, to help me form a stable grasp. So absolutely for grasping, you're gonna to have to have tactile perception. Uh, and that's an area that people have been working on as long as I've been doing robotics. And they don't seem to have been working very effectively because we still don't have good fingertips. Uh, and then uh, the force information uh, from, from, from the wrist or from the fingers is gonna be absolutely critical as well. So yeah, well, I think we need all of those. Well, integration seems to be one of the big steps from reptilian uh, sort of perception to mammalian perception, right? Because a snake uses its senses in a serial fashion. It uses, uh, you know, vision uh, to see the moving mouse strikes, and then it, you know, uses heat sensing, right, in a serial way. Whereas a cat hunts using all of its senses, and when the mouse even disappears be behind the curtain, it's waiting on the other side, ready to pounce. So that's yeah, because so we can do modeling and we can do predictions, which yeah. the reptiles you know, got a brain that's big. Yeah, 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 I understand. <coughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Peter. That was amazing. Very well done. <laughs>